go. So we are streaming. So the streaming thing is really convenient for me because I, now I don't have to worry about there's not enough space or there's a little, you know, problem with my SSD. You know, it's pretty reliable. <coughs> so that's good. It's freezing? Oh, you mean this part here? Um, you are correct because I changed the uh, resolution of the screen, so it's not uh, doing that correctly. Let me see if I can close it and do it all again. Remain. There we go. Okay, I guess I don't really need a Firefox for this part. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think I need it. Um, okay, so first thing first, we need to make sure that the microcode of the instructions or the optos are implemented correctly, because that can uh, yeah that can be bad. So if we go to optos and then we look at the instructions. Ink is here, deck is here, so we know for sure the instructions, at least the files are here, um, and I think these are correct. Okay, so we have decrement using e zero. And then we have increment using D0. Okay, so these are the things that we double checked last time. And I believe they should be working. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the date of all.rom. In this folder, it's the 20th, and today is the 25th, so that's exactly five days ago. Um, and I did this. Hmm, okay. And then we want to look at the uh, date stamp of the all.rom file in the parent folder. It's the same one. So maybe it is just the way I start the processor. It didn't incorporate that new ROM file. Possibly. We'll test that first. Okay. So we'll go ahead and test that. Um, Java-jar downloads logic sim generic. Processor, processor, WDPC two dot circ. Okay, so we have the FC, these are all correct. And then we go to the ROM. <clears throat> And what I'll do is I'm going to check whether it made any changes. So we go to location e, uh, D00 first, <clears throat> just to observe what it is now, and then we'll load, load the new content. So right now it's D, uh, that seems correct to me, D8, uh, and then this is a 0, 0, 0, 08, 5D, so it looks like the pattern is working. Oh, this is not working, is it? Because the four is supposed to look like every other one, and then the five is supposed to look like the zero. Okay, so we'll go ahead and open um, all that ROM, and we have the D zero, the five, and the next one is going to be the A. Okay, so now they 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 look correct to me. Okay, all right. So let's go ahead and. Give it a try. I, I needed the uh, assembler after all because I didn't save the uh, RAM file to a place where it is persistent because the, in the temp folder, they all get deleted when I restart the machine. So I have to re-download this file. So we'll go ahead and re-download this file. And we'll put it in as um, find max again. Go to logic sim. We can close this because I'm pretty sure this is now correct. Um, we can double check the other one too. Uh, E0, and then we have E5. Yep, it, it looks like it because the, the 0, 5, A, and F should break the pattern, and they are doing that right here. So I'm fairly sure this is okay. So now we go to here and hit the reset button first. And then load the RAM content. Let's see, 
get speed. There we go. Um, do the logging again because you, you, you saw how useful, useful logging is. So we're going to do the same thing here. Uh, register D as the stack pointer. We will also uh, log the program counter and the last the last three locations in memory because we know those locations will be modified in a certain way. All right, so that's good. Turn on simulation. We can we can crank up the simulation frequency because you know for the most part we are not really watching it go it you know, do it. So we will just crank it up and. Yeah, that's pretty fast. <laughs> we just have to look at the program counter and make sure that it's not changing anymore. It is now at 0F, OK? OK, so the question is 0F, our halt instruction. We can check that pretty easily because the assembler does give us you know, all those locations if you look at the other tabs. So if you look at the assemble tab and scroll down, you know, we can look at the halt instruction, which is row 21. And when we scroll over, row 21 has an address of 16 in decimal, which is um, one zero in hexadecimal. Go back to LogicSim, and it is stuck at the location 0F in the program counter. Hmm, it's one before one zero. Did I count incorrectly? Now this is the halt instruction, and it is supposed to be at location one six. Hmm. Okay, what about the opcode? The opcode that it has, the last code it decoded, is a one zero instead of a zero one, so that is incorrect also. Hmm. But I don't even see where the one zero is. Oh, this is the. That's not sixteen. Hmm. Isn't that sixteen in the? But one zero. Sixteen. This is the location. This is the content. And this is location um, fifteen, which is zero F, which is supposed to have a content of one one instead of one zero. Oh, okay. So pretty sure it's not doing everything correctly, but we'll we'll check. So let's stop the simulation, or stop the takes. The simulation is still going, but the uh, takes is stopped. And then go to logging, go to table, and see what is going on with the things that we are logging. All right, so the first thing we check is the uh, stack pointer. Stack pointer is healthy. It went from zero to FF, which is the last location. Decrement, decrement. Um, and then it got some kind of bogus value here. Okay, so that's kind of questionable. Uh, we look at the RAM content. Um, 255 is supposed to store the return address. Uh, the next one is supposed to store a Y, which is 61, right? And then the other one is supposed to store, what was it? Um, oh, I take it back. This is the return address. This is the return address, which turns out to be one zero. So that one zero is coming from somewhere, and this may be it. Okay. Um, and then we have the the two values being pushed on the stack, and I think these are correct. This is thirty two plus sixteen plus eight plus five. That sounds like sixty one to me. This one is uh, twenty three. 16 plus 7, that's 23. So we know the stack operations, you know, worked out just fine. And the first sign that we are in big trouble, if I just kind of take a quick glance at this, is how the stack pointer got changed. Um, okay, wait, over here. So how the stack pointer got changed over here, this is not, this is not right, okay? We can see it decrement, 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 okay? We can see it go from 0 to FF. FF to FE, FE to FD, okay? And then after that, it should increment again when we return, but it did not. Instead, it got this value of zero, uh, of one zero in D. 
So we know this is you know, where things you know, have, have gone wrong. And then we have to look up this, uh, the program counter and figure out, okay, you know, what, approximately where did we end up with these you know, bogus values. So we have location 11, location 12. So those are the locations you know, that we need to double check in the program itself. Um, so let's go check the program. So let's go, we go back to the assembler and switch back to the source. So the subroutine itself, you know, it's not working correctly um, because this is, we, we should see the stack pointer incrementing, but we, it did not. We did not see that happening. Um, and then when we go to the assemble, we can actually see the, the, the location of that, of those locations. This is location 1.6, which means you know, we are not supposed to, oh, location 1.1 one one is this location, which is find max itself. So find max itself has location 1.1 one one and then 1.2. One when we go back to logic sim, look at the trace here, we are at location 1.1, one one, location 1.2, one and at location 1.2, the stack pointer got messed up to a 1.0. So when we look at the code, location 1, 2, or 17 in decimal is this one, and the code, oops, uh, yep, okay, so I just have to go back to the correct tab. Okay, so we are looking at row three, 33, which is corresponding to the increment instruction. So the increment instruction is not uh, done correctly. It is affecting register D, which it is not supposed to. Um, the opcode itself is correct. D0 is the correct opcode. That's the correct opcode. We copy register D to register A in the previous instruction or location 11. We go back to logic sim and we look at location 11 in PC, which is this one here and the register D has not been changed yet. So register D is changed to one zero because of the increment instruction. So we kind of, this is a pretty good indication that the increment instruction is not working correctly. The increment instruction is, um, in terms of opcode, I think so. I thought so. I thought it worked last time, but something is definitely not working here because the because register D got trashed when it's not supposed to. Um, so now we can go back to the to logic sim, go to location D zero, and see what it looks like. Okay, so D zero looks looks right to me because it lo it has the same pattern as D five. But it changed register D at that point. All right, so when we encounter problems like that, then we simplify the program until we can reproduce the problem with the smallest number of instructions. So we just go ahead and change the program to LDI um, D0, LDI A1, uh, let, let's make it three, decrement A, and then the halt instruction. So this one, you know, we should just end up with zero in D, uh, three, two in A, by the time we get to the halt instruction. And with this one, it's so easy. We, we can just hand enter the, the code in the RAM file. So 6F0, 6C3, and then E0. And the 0, 1. Okay, close that trace. Let's close this one too. Hit the reset button. And 
let me just go here and edit the content. 6F0, 6F0, 6C03, 6C03, E001, E0, and 01. Just clock this one. Okay. And then look at take a look at the registers. Um, register A has a value of two, which is correct. Register D has a value of zero, which is also correct. So the increment instruction worked just fine here. Hmm. Okay, we'll do the same thing. Yeah, because logic sim is known to be able to crash and do other things. So we'll go ahead and save this, and then just restart it, just in case it is a logic sim issue. Okay, so we can put it back in, reset. And this time we'll go ahead and reload the program that we were trying to run, which is findmax.csv. Um, go through the same logging. So we want to log the program counter, the last three locations in RAM. Uh, we want to log the registers. And this time I'll just be saved and log all of them. Just so that you know, we can see how the other registers are also getting changed. Um, that's it. Okay, we'll go ahead and do the simulation and take a look at what the program counter is stuck at. So it has the same symptom as last time. The program counter is stuck at zero F. All right, so it's not a glitch because of logic sim; it is reproducible. And we go to table. Take a look at all of this stuff here. and examine register D first because that's our stack pointer. And the stack pointer still got trashed right here. It went from FB all the way to a one zero. Sorry? Uh, line 32, you copied register A into register D. Oh, I flipped it. Yeah, you had to. <laughs> Good catch. So the program did work the way it's supposed to. The bug is in my head. Register A, if you see the, the login, it has mm -hmm. that value. Oh boy. Thank you. Good job. Copy in the wrong direction. So we want A, D because it's flipping the direction. Ah. There we go. Okay, so the rest probably is, is fine. Okay, so we'll take a look at. RAM file. Yep. Was this still in your uh, debug at the top of that? Hmm? Say that one more time. The little mini program you made to test? Mm hmm. Isn't that still right there at the top of that? Um. Oh, you're right, because, um, yep, you mean this one? <laughs> yep, that it will do. Okay, so this is the main program we're supposed to <coughs> call Timax. I don't think there's a whole lot of stuff before this. I know there's a label of main which doesn't do a single thing. We have to clear the stack corner. And I don't think there's anything else before this other than a load D with a zero. Pretty sure that's the case. There might be some comments you know, before this, but I don't think there's anything else before this. Okay. Save the RAM file one more time. to log 
about your sim, hit the reset, load image, one more time, so we'll put the click, ticks, look at uh, the program counter, okay, this, this time it looks healthy because we are, um, the instruction register has a zero one, which is the halt instruction, and then the program counter has one one, which is the location where the halt instruction is located. So they're looking healthy. Uh, we want to look look at the registers now. The registers has FF in register A, which is not right. <laughs> it is still not right, but the execution path is is better. Okay, so let's stop the simulation or stop the ticks and go to the logging. And this time we have to be careful to ignore the first part of the logging because it is just appending to the other one. So we have to remember to do that. Um, the program starts with location zero. So when we look at the program counter, which is here, we just have to find out where the zero, the last zero zero is, which is here. Okay. And then we can see these are the, this is the content of the stack. This is 60, 61, this is 23, this is the return address. Those are all good. Um, and then these are the registers. Okay, so something is not. Okay, this is a register. This is register A, B, C, D. So this is register D. Okay, register D starts with the maximum value. It got it got decremented. And here's one extra decrement that it's not supposed to see. And that is at location two zero. No, that's just the uh, the router thing. Don't worry, there are no no clocks in it. <laughs> I bet you it's one of those direction thing. I got the wrong direction again. Uh, CPR. Oh, there we go. Copying. You know. Uh, the direction is wrong again. And same with this one. <laughs> okay. Well, at least I was consistent. <laughs> okay. So copying D to A, okay, copying C to A, copying B to A. The load instruction and the store instruction, I'm not too concerned about because you know, the parentheses are pretty clear. That's the RAM location, you know. So I'm not. I'm pretty sure that's not going to be a problem. All right, let's do it again. Okay, download as CSV. again reload the content and there's no easy way to clear the log you know I think that's kind of troublesome so we can remove and then add it back and the table is still here it doesn't clear itself There's no, there's no button to reset the logging. Do you think reset the uh, simulation will do it? Let's see. Nope, that didn't do it. It did clear all the RAM locations now. Enable, 
sad. Uh, doesn't like it. Mm. Yep, sounds like it. Okay. Well, I pressed the reset button, but it won't depress. So maybe we just we should just reload it. <laughs> so it's got some problem. Exception in thread four. The logging is definitely in interfering. Okay. So let's do one more time. Load image. Simulation, go to logging, program counter, last three locations in RAM. Will the updated ROM be saved? Hmm? Will the updated ROM be saved? Yeah, it usually saves that. But it doesn't hurt to load it again, so I will do that. Um, and we also want to log all the registers, so we go to the register bank. log all of these. There we go. And just to be sure, we will reload the ROM content, just to be sure. So all that ROM. Okay, very good. Now we are ready to go simulate again. Okay. Stop the ticking. Go to the registers. Yep, okay, so this time we got it. It's a uh, 3D is the correct result. Any questions about this program or the debugging tools? No questions. I'm thinking about you know adding a debugging capability into the processor so it can at least you know, set up a, like a breakpoint. So when it gets to a certain location, it would just kind of stop until you kind of switch a flag. Um, that might be helpful for debugging, but you know that might increase the complexity of the processor as well, because that capability is not inside LogiSim itself. You cannot tell LogiSim to stop the clicking or to stop the clocking um, when you get to a certain address or when certain a certain condition is met, because that would be very useful for debugging. We just kind of stop, and you can see, oh, okay, at least I I got to this point, and then continue, continue, continue. Um, but at this point, there's no such tool inside LogiSim to debug. Yep. Uh, two questions. So yeah. Can you explain uh, why why is X go to for Y on the stack? That's yep. The return address is the it has the lowest address because it's the last thing that you put on the stack, from the caller's perspective. Okay. It's the last thing in the stack. It's the last thing you put in the stack. It's the last thing that you put on the stack. Right. Position number like two fifteen. It's two fifty three. Two fifty three has the return address. Two fifty five is parameter Y, which is sixty one. Uh, 254 is 223 which is parameter X okay. so everything has to do with you know how the uh, parameters are put onto the stack so when you look at the callers perspective which is in main the first thing that we put onto the stack is 61 that's parameter Y uh, so, so it has the highest address Because in C and C++, you know, we have the dot dot dot, you know, in parameters. That requires, you know, the first parameter to have an address that is less than the second parameter and so on. And this is the only way to make sure that happens. <coughs> but in Pascal, there's no such uh, programming language feature. The dot 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 notation or the, that whole construct does not exist in Pascal. So in Pascal, you can you if you say that this this uh, subroutine has six parameters, it must have exactly six parameters. But in C and C plus plus, you can have a variable number of parameters 
which is what I illustrated in class with find max n, right? So in that case, in order to find the other stuff that is also your parameters, but it's not spelled out, that it requires the first parameter to have the lowest address, because otherwise you cannot find the other ones. And that's the reason why in almost every single C++ and C implementation, the ordering of the parameters is always like that. The first parameter is always having a lower address than the second one. But because in the stack, you know, you, you push, when you push or when you store things onto the stack, the later, the later things that you store has a lower address. So that's why we have to flip the order and store parameter Y on the stack first, and then parameter X, and then the return address. And then this is the instruction that will continue execution in the subroutine. But together, in most you know, uh, sys architectures, these four instructions are combined into a call instruction, a single instruction called call. And that's why, you know, even though we can put the return address any way, anywhere we want because you know, we have full control over these instructions, but in the case of a, of a sys architecture and many risk architectures, these four lines are kind of compacted into one single opcode, so you don't really have a chance to, you know, do it in any other ordering. Okay. So this is really useful because even though this program is not recursive, it has demonstrated everything that you actually need to know, or just about everything that you need to know to implement Fibonacci. Because in Fibonacci, the only thing that's different is it is recursive. In fact, this program is more complex in a way. It has two parameters. Fibonacci only has one, right? Have we demonstrated how to call a subroutine in in this particular program? Yes. So is the mechanism of calling a subroutine going to change because it is recursive? No. There you go. Okay. Now the real tricky part of uh, Fibonacci is the first time. Okay, it's probably helpful to just to show it first. Well, I, I haven't. Uh, I didn't keep. I did not keep the. Uh, the other program, but when you when you do something like this, okay. So let's say you want to implement this, okay. Return f of n minus one plus uh, f of n minus two, okay. So when you implement this code, you have to be very careful because the, when you return, when you get back from the first invocation of f, register a has the return value of this thing, right? And then you have to somehow call f again, which is going to trash register a. Do you see what I mean? You have to we, save it somewhere. So the question is, where are you going to save so that it is safe, so that nobody's going to trash it? No, register D is cannot. Register D is the stack pointer. Don't touch register D except for being a stack pointer. You cannot store it to a static place because you know the recursion, they will all try to use the same static place in RAM. So you cannot store it in a static place in RAM. You cannot use register B or C because they all, all invocations of Fibonacci will use register B, C, A, and so on. So the only safe place is the stack itself. Okay? So my clue to you is after the first invocation, the first recursive invocation, Whatever is in A, put it on the stack. Store it on the stack. Do we know how to store something on the stack? Yes. Okay. Put it on the stack because once you put it on the stack and you adjust the stack pointer correctly, nobody's going to touch it. Okay. Then you proceed to call it a second time. When you return from the second invocation, A already has the result of the second invocation. The result from the first invocation is on the stack itself. Do we know how to grab something back on the stack? Yes. Yep. So the only part that is going to be tricky is once you grab the result of the first invocation from the stack, you have to make sure that you adjust the stack pointer accordingly. Because otherwise, you won't be able to get back to the return address. It will be at the wrong place. And there are, there are only two ways to adjust stack. You either increment or decrement. Yes. When you store, you decrement. You decrement, then then you store. When you retrieve, then you retrieve first, and then you increment. 
So those are the things you have to remember because if you don't do it in that particular order or if you forget to do the increment or the decrement, then you're going to mess up the stack. And then if you mess up the stack, you know, things will go very wrong because you'll be using the wrong location as a return address and it will go to La La Land and it will just do all kinds of funky stuff. <laughs> okay? So this is important. This is really kind of the tricky part of this particular homework assignment is this. And then the other part is how do you call f again, but this time but only using n minus 1 as a value. You don't want to change n, which is the parameter itself. You just want to leave n as is, right? So what you do is you grab n, okay? We already show you know, we, we already have the code to show you how to get a parameter. So once it is in a uh, register, do the minus one in that register before you put it on the stack. The decrement? Huh? The decrement or the decrement in this case. Okay. So when you so the, the call instruction here, so the, the sequence of doing things is to get parameter n, okay? Put it into a register, okay? To I don't know, so let's call that register B. Okay. Um, and then you want to decrement register B and then you store B on stack. In other words, you're not changing parameter n itself because you will need it later, except the second time you want to decrement it one more time. Okay. So you could just store uh, b or c into b or b into c and then decrement that one, right? But when you invoke, when when you call f again, all the registers all will be gone again. Yeah. So you don't want to count on a register still containing a particular value after a call to any subroutine, okay? So right before the actual call, you just have to say, okay, is it safe, you know? Um, am I going to rely on the value of registers after the subroutine returns? If you do, then you better put it on the stack and save it. Because whenever you invoke a subroutine, all the registers potentially can change, other than register D. Uh, so yep. we, can, we can save stuff But the stack is much store, bigger. Yes, the stack can keep multiple values. Yes. And when, when we do you set invocation, the register getting uh, like updated or uh, cleared up? Or? Well, every subroutine can change registers. So when you're doing a recursive subroutine call, which is this part here, that call can potentially change all of your registers, except for register D, which is the stack order. So if you have, at this point, if you have some useful thing that you're relying and say, I'm, I'm counting on this to be on in one particular register, you cannot make that assumption anymore. So right before you do the call, you have to save it on the stack first before you call the subroutine again. And after the subroutine returns, then you go to the stack and go like, okay, let me go back and grab that thing back. You just have to keep a good track of where in the stack we save stuff. Where on the stack did you say what? Yes. <laughs> the Fibonacci program is not particularly bad because you don't need really any local variables. But by the time you need local variables and stuff like that, then it gets really difficult to track. And that's why I, choose, I chose a Fibonacci because it, it's difficult enough that you have to really do things in the right way, but it's not so hard that you, it, it's impossible for you to track. Why are local variables so much? Because local variables are on the other side. Um, that's a good question. So, so let's take a look at a, uh, at a function where it has two parameters and a local variable. Okay? And we don't even care about what kind of code goes here. Okay? So as far as the standard is concerned, okay, in, when you look at you know, what the stack looks like when we get to the label f, so when we get to the label f, you can count on the stack having these things. Y is has the highest address, x is next to it, and then the return address is lower than that. Okay, so the same thing that we talked about in class today, right? But where are you going to put your result, your local variable? You cannot use a register because you know, the registers are very busily being used by, for calculations and whatnot. So re result is not going to be in a register. So what you're going to do is to say, oh, result is going to be here. 
And then the only thing in this class that we can count on is the stack pointer is always pointing to the return address by the time you get here. So that means, you know, in the subroutine itself, you will have to say, oh, I need to allocate this space here so the stack pointer is now pointing to the result. Your local variables are also on the stack. But by doing this, you, you, by the time you return from the subroutine, you have to remember to change the stack pointer back to here before you retrieve the return address. So that's why, you know, when you use local variables, it kind of complicates the use of the stack a little bit and it affects, you know, how you return because you have to kind of move the stack pointer back to where it is supposed to, where it's supposed to find the return address. But Fibonacci does not need uh, local variables, so that really kind of helps to make it easier. Is that okay? So when you look at this particular program, it does illustrate most of the concepts besides you know, not counting the trick that you're going to ha have to deal with here when you have two spots to do the recursive call and all the registers will be gone you know, when you do the invocation. So if you have anything to save, which is the, which is the value of f of n minus 1, you have to put it on the stack. That is the, probably the trickiest part of this entire assignment is that part. Any questions, any particular concern of, you know, the, the Fibonacci number problem? That's why you got two weeks. <laughs> okay, so here's the question. How are you going to implement and test your program? How do you get started? How do you test your program gradually? Because you don't want to write the entire thing with like the you know, 40, 50 lines of code and then try to run it and see if it works. Okay, that's, that's gonna be painful. Can be done, not recommended. So what are you gonna do? How do you simplify the Fibonacci number problem to the point where it is much easier to write, much easier to debug, but it still maintains what you need to do? Yep. I think we just uh, get rid of the function, the second call, n minus two, mm -hmm. and work with just one. Mm -hmm. Test it if it works, and if it works, we add the second one. Well, but the, the problem of, yeah, you can do that. I mean, that, that will certainly work. Yeah, it's, uh, yep. To test the, everything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then we'll, we'll still need to write uh, int name to test it. Yes. Because for the homework, we just need the function. Yep. But well, as long as your uh, function, you know, I will have to specify what label, you know, I'm expecting you to use. I can just copy and paste your code onto mine, which does the caller stuff. So that's that's not going to be a big problem. I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about that part too much. So how? So once again, you know, how do you you know? You don't want to start with um, Fibonacci, so what I would do is I'm going to write a much easier subroutine, something like this. Okay, if n is zero, okay, and if you want to make it complicated, you can do that. Um, but I will just make it, you know, return one when n is zero, else. Um, oops return uh, just f of n plus 1, okay, n minus 1, and then plus 1, okay? So what do you think this is going to do? In, in main, okay, so in main right here, if I say, you know, f of 22, 23, what is going to be the return value of f of 23? Yep, 24. That's right. If you change this you know, 1 to a 0, then it will just return whatever n is. This is just a little offset. But if you do this first, you know, that will give you a simpler program to deal with, with only <coughs> one single point of recursion. And if you don't take any shortcuts to get this done, then the other one, the Fibonacci number one, is going to be easier to deal with. 
But I would do something like this first, you know, just to make sure that we that we know how to use the stack, how to call, how to return, how to get to the parameters and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. With a number, do you remember for the floating point, you mm -hmm. gave us in main and two, stat, two test cases? Mm -hmm. so we'll, can you do the same for this stuff? Like, uh, you mean for Fibonacci? Yeah, test case. Not a test case but, uh, you can do your own test case. I mean, you can just you know have your own main. Okay, so what you do is you you write your own main, and then um, so your own main has to do. I mean, to test a program, you have to do this, right? So you have to initialize the stack pointer one thing and then you just have to test okay let's say you want to test the Fibonacci number of I don't know five okay so what you do is you um, decrement D to allocate one spot on the stack um, LDI A with five because you know that's what you want that's the parameter and then you do a ST to whatever D is pointing to the stack one is pointing to and whatever is in A you want to store that into the, under the stack and then you just call your subroutine. So that's how, in, and then after this, you know, at the return address, you can do the same trick that I do, which is just to put a halt instruction here so the program does not proceed any further after this point. So I would just go with simpler programs first, you know, just to make sure that it works. Now, when you're trying to test a mechanism like this, but you can do it in, in a non-recursive way. Okay, so try to do something like this. Okay, try to write a subroutine called five, and the only thing it's going to do is return the actual value of five, um, and then have another program, I mean subroutine called four, and you probably guess what it's going to do. That's what it's going to do. Okay, so in assembly code, you want to do a main, where in main you want to calculate, you know, five plus four. Okay. But it's going to trigger the same kind of problem that you might encounter, you know. Well, yes, this will this will give you exactly the same problem, because after the first call to five, the return value is in register A, right? But you better do something with it to store it somewhere else before you call four, because four is going to just try to will will we'll store the value of four in register A too. And then your job is to add the value of this return, add this return value to this return value here. So you can kind of imagine that you know if you have something here to actually store the value, what do you have to do to get this work, to get this to work? That's the, the that's exactly the same thing that you have to deal with in order to get this done. It's just that in this case it is recursive. It looks you know a lot more complicated and ugly, and in this case it looks simpler. But the mechanism that you need. It's the same. You have to store that return value on the stack first. So when you do something like this, it, it really helps because okay, so don't do it like this. You know, if you want it to be a little bit more kind of interesting, so call this subroutine nine, right? And then you're just gonna return this. So you can actually implement programs <coughs> that are non-recursive. But it has some of the similar aspects that you have to deal with in your Fibonacci homework assignment. Are you, are you guys catching the, uh, the tricks here? You know, like you know what kind, how how to approach you know this program. I would do the, all of these toy programs first. Okay, if you run into problems getting this done, you know, bring it up on Thursday. So we'll we'll have these things done first. On Thursday, I will illustrate how to get it done. Um, I will not give you, you know, enough clues so that you know, the homework assignment is trivial because I think you guys can do it, okay? But if you do run into problems, like you know, when I try to do something like this, you know, something that is unexplainable happens, bring it up on Thursday so that we have a chance to kind of talk about it. Is that okay so far? Okay. So we're gonna start off. Sorry? Fibonacci is going to start off with 1, 1. It's going to be, um, in the homework assignment, I think I use uh, the 2, you know, f of 2 is 1, f of 1 is 1. Yes, that, yeah. you're correct. We start with 1, 1 and not 0, 1. Right. Correct. Okay. Yep. I, I didn't catch you know, what you meant when you said, said 1, 1. Okay. 
So the first one would that, that would be zero. That would be the zero. Yeah, we start with f of two zero. is by definition one, and then f of one is by definition one. Yes. So those two are the base bases of uh, Fibonacci. Yep. So when we source in the stack and then call another function after, we store the stack and then store the parameters and then the return function and then increment three times and once you finish that call the return value of the other function will be right there if it's pointed. Okay, so that's something that we didn't really talk about is you know what do we do with the parameters once you return from the subroutine. Yeah. Okay. The caller really should clean it up. So that means you know in this particular program, um, in main, okay, so in main, you know, this is the call itself. Uh, we push the two parameters and then we actually do the call. I was lazy, you know, because I really should be you know, clearing the stack for those two parameters at this point, which can be done in um, two increment instructions. So you can say increment D, increment D, and then the halt instruction. So that would, the, that would be the proper way because now the stack pointer would be exactly getting back to the same point when we started. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You have to. Uh, the caller is responsible to clear those th from the stack. Yep. Very good point. Okay. Any other questions? How do you test your code? I mean, you know, how do you write a simple program and test it using logic? Sync? Use the uh, the logging feature. You know, that's really really helpful. Um, and also, the other trick that you can do is to move the the halt instruction from one place to another place. So that you can at least confirm, did I get here? Did I get here? Did I get here? When I got here, what is the value? When I got here, what is the value? And so on. So that can be really helpful. It's like setting a breakpoint. It's like setting up a breakpoint, right? Yeah, I'm considering you know changing the architecture so that you have some limited debugging capability. So you can set up a register. When the PC gets to that particular address, it will stop execution. And then you can click one of the buttons so that it will clear something so the execution can continue after that point. So that can be useful. But the log feature is the current in a way, the only way to do uh, debugging at this point. Is that okay? What's the largest Fibonacci value that the processor can handle? It's based on how deep the stack can go. <laughs> so because you know, because one branch of Fibonacci is only n minus one, so that means whatever n is, is the the depth. Well, n minus one is going to be the maximum depth that you need. And then for each level of the stack, you need at least two bytes because you need one byte for the parameter itself, and you need another byte for the return address. But it actually needs three bytes because before the call to the second, uh, after the first call returns and when you set up the second call, you also have to store the return value of the first recursive call on the stack. So each invocation can potentially use up to three bytes. So And those three bytes are being allocated from the end of memory. So your program is going forward and the stack is going backwards. So it's based on how much code you need in order to implement this program. Whatever is left is what you have on the stack. So I would I would be careful too. <laughs> your program itself, yes, that would not be good. That would not be pleasant. <laughs> that would not be pleasant. Yep. And that's something else that you can also, well, I guess not in this processor, but when you compare the program counter and the stack pointer, if your program counter is greater than or equal to the stack pointer, you're in big trouble. <laughs> but that's a good point. That's, that's uh, something that you have, you have to watch out for. I would assume that you can at least get to Fibonacci of four or five, so that you can actually see the recursion happening. Um, as long as you don't make it too crazy, like the Fibonacci of 50, you know, that's definitely not, it's not going to work. 
I don't think the code of this program is going to be really, really long. It's just really tricky to write and debug. So that's why you need to get, get the basic concepts down first by testing those concepts in smaller, simpler programs first before you try to incorporate those into the more complicated context. Is that okay? If you guys think this is not challenging enough, you know, we can do a Tower of Hanoi next. Do you guys remember, do you know what is Tower of Hanoi? Yeah. It is actually a lot more, it looks a lot more complicated than it really is. Okay, so this is uh, the Tower of Hanoi. Okay, I guess we have to say Tower of. There we go, Tower of Hanoi. So the idea is you have to move all of these disks from one end to another end. But the restriction is you can only move one disk at a time, and a smaller disk can be only on top of a larger disk. Okay, so how do you do it? It is recursive. <laughs> okay. Well, since we are on recursion, I know you guys might want to go home and get dinner, but since we're here, um, might as well I'll talk about this just a little bit. Have you guys talked about this in other classes, like data yeah. structure? Or okay. But this is the this is how you know, this is why you know, um, recursion is so powerful because you know it is the way of looking at things. So the base case is um, when you only have one disk, how do you do it? There's only one disk. You want to move this one disk from A to C. A, just move it. Yeah, just move it. Okay, so that's easy. Cool. Um, when you have more than one disk, what do you do? So what, when you have more than one disk, what you do is you look at the thing as two portions. There's the disk all the way at the bottom and the rest. Okay. So you say, oh, I want to move this bunch all the way to the middle one first. Okay. Exactly how do we do that? Don't ask me yet, okay? You know, I'm just saying that we can do that. And then we'll do this one. We'll put the largest disk to its own destination, right? So it is now in place. And then you move this bunch of disks back on top of the largest disk, and you're done, right? So of course, you know, now the big problem is well, it, it, it sounds so easy. You know, we just have to move this entire stack of, that, of disks other than the largest one from, from pole A to pole B, and then from pole B to pole C. But how do we do that? Well, it's the same logic as the original problem, except it is one disk viewer. And that's why we can do the recursion. So, so in Towers of Hanoi, okay, so you say Hanoi, you have uh, three parameters, okay, so you have, you know, which one is pole A, pole A, which one is pole B, or through, and which one is pole C, which is destination, and how many disks are we moving, okay? So this is source, where are we moving from, this is through, which is the temporary, you know, temporary pole that we can use, and this is your destination, which is where we want it to move to. Is that okay? So the then you say if n equals one or less, you know, if you don't have to move anything, then you have to you don't have to do anything. So if n equals to one, it's easy, just move it, right? So <coughs> there's no there's nothing really to do unless you're using a robotic system where you you can actually move things around. So for the most part, you just print out on the screen or use some kind of graphics to show that you're moving that disk, okay? So you just say move from uh, source to a pole A to pole C. Okay, pole A to pole C, and you're done. If N is greater than one, then you do the recursive one. So the recursive one is to do the uh, is to move, okay, so just, then you do the recursive call of Hanoi, 
So now you have to be careful because you are moving from pole A through pole C to pole B. Okay, so you're switching the rows of the poles to, to get this done. But you're also subtracting one from N because now you're moving everything except for the bottom disk. Then you say move disk, which is the bottom disk, from pole A to C. And then you do another recursive call, this time from pole B, which is where the, the, the entire stack of poles are, I mean the entire stack of smaller disks are, through pole A to pole C. And once again, we have n minus 1 disks to move. And that's Tower of Hanoi. So it, is, it sounds a lot more complicated than it really is, because the solution is recursive. You try to break the problem, the big problem, into a smaller problem. But the nature of the smaller problem is exactly the same as the original problem, except it has one fewer disk to deal with. Yep. So you work from the bottom up, instead of trying to work from the top down, when you're doing uh, doing work from the back, mm -hmm. so, okay. In a way, it is top-down, you know, it's hard to say whether it's top-down or bottom-up, because when you do this recursively, you won't get to this point until you keep doing this until you, you get to that point, right? So by the time you get to the actual point here, then you have already done a lot of these recursive calls. But none of these recursive calls is actually moving anything. They're all just you know, stacking up the invocations until we get to here. Then you're actually moving something. But after you return, then you're also moving something else, and then you do the recursive call again. Yeah, there are animations of this. I think uh, Wikipedia actually has a particular uh, animation of it too. Yep, there you go. So it has a uh, it has a four disc animation. The story of uh, Towers of Hanoi is interesting too. I think they're supposed to move sixty four discs. It's a lot, okay, to do it manually because the number, the amount of time it takes is two to the power of the number of discs. If you have, if you increase the number of disks by one, you are doubling the amount of time it takes. Should have chosen this one for my for our assignment. <laughs> you just work, just work the tiny little toy processor to death, right? I mean. <laughs> but the animation is actually pretty good. I mean, it shows you, you know, how it's all done. Poby is like a temporary thing, but the row of the pose, you know, keeps switching because the time, the moment you do the recursive call, you're switching which pole is the through and which one is the source and which one is the destination. But the power of your know, recursive algorithms is just that. I mean, you're looking at a bigger problem, and the way you solve the problem is you you do a little bit of work, okay and turn the rest of the problem into something that is in structure and in nature similar to the problem that was given to you to begin with. And that's how you can do recursion. All right, well, I, we, are, we have 10 minutes left. If you guys have any questions or want to get a head start, we can do that. But I'm going to stop the recording or the lecture part at this point.